Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today, I'm really excited to have on the Plant Cunning Podcast crew. That's AC Stobel and Isaac Hill. Welcome to the show, you two. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank for, you so much. Yeah, really excited. Mm -hmm. Same. And uh, yeah, I just posted in the Herb Rally uh, Schoolhouse Facebook group. I said I'm. we'll be interviewing you two and uh, uh, our good friend, Logan Keister. Not sure if you know Logan yet, but... Um, uh, he's an awesome herbalist yeah. and, um, yeah. he said, he said two of my favorite, co uh, podcasts combined. So Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. Welcome to the Herbalist Hour. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweet and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Oh, mommy, it's time for the Herbalist Hour. Exactly. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm excited to get to know you two a little bit more. So why don't we start from the beginning? Well, let's start from you two's beginning, if that's how you say it. Um, how did you two meet? We met traveling on the road when I was traveling around in my mini school bus apothecary called the Butter Bus. And uh -huh. Isaac was um, traveling with his band, The Hills and the Rivers. And we met playing um, a game at a rainbow gathering. And yeah. then again, at this house show with a band called the Railyard Ghosts in Arizona. And I remember just seeing him by the fire playing his instrument and being like, who is this future husband? <laughs> <laughs> it was like an, it was like an immediate like, this person's going to be in my life for a minute. And so we had this really long courtship where we didn't see each other for months because we were both travelers. And I was in herb school with Seven Song for uh, some of that time. And then um we decided to just like move to the same place and start, you know, a life together and haven't looked back since. Yeah. Awesome. Anything to add to that, Isaac? <laughs> well, yeah, we did, we got together. I played a house show. Like when we got together, I played a house show at her mm -hmm. place in Ithaca um, where she was studying with seven song. Um, and that's also, also where I was born, you know? So mm. it was like a, oh, wow. one of those yeah. fun, fun moments there. Yeah. I remember yeah. he was like dropping, names on the uh, of um uh, dropping latin names of plants on the porch and i was like that's so oh, hot <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you know uh being a giant plant nerd uh is good in like herbalist community you know <laughs> situations totally. but you know most of the time people are not like oh a simina triloba i love <laughs> berberus nervosa Ew. they're like oh, you're a nerd <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, well, y'all are back in, uh, I want to say, is it like central New York now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we live in a little herb farm and homestead in the central New York region near Cooperstown in Utica. And is, um, that, is that close to Ithaca? My geography is all off. It's about an hour and a half. East oh, of not Ithaca. too shabby. Yeah. Okay. So I actually yeah. just went back to visit seven song. We had lunch a few weeks ago. So nice. I love that guy. I know oh. you too. Well, um, Awesome. Well, you mentioned studying with Seven Song. Uh, what are your herbal origins otherwise, AC? How'd you get into this whole plant thing? Well, um, I grew up really loving nature. So there, there's that. You know, most herbalists do have some connection from an early age to nature, I find. And um, in my 20s, I started running a little technology cafe that we did computer repair, website design, and I was trying to source local teas. And so that brought me to... The plant people, which was they started taking me on plant walks and telling me about herbs for my asthma. And I started trying herbs and seeing how they really impacted um, my health and my life quite well. And um, I switched gears from the tech collective at a certain point to go live and work at an herb farm called Twee Fontaine Herb Farm mm. in the Hudson Valley, New York, which was a beautiful property with a collectively run business model where seven of us would make herbal products, grow the herbs that we use and bring them to New York City's um, Union Square market. So it was a huge market. We had like 15,000 people a day coming by our stand. And wow. there I realized like, I just did not know anything about herbs. You know, like people would ask me questions about their health. I'm like, I'm just the grower. I don't <laughs> you know. I'm not sure. So that kind of sparked my studies. And I started um, a once a month program with a local New Paltz herbalist, Helena Shepko, and she um, is a Ukrainian American herbalist who taught me a lot about how to use plants in your daily diet. And um, it was kind of a really nice like intro to herbalism and just continuing studying from there. Eventually ended up with Seven Song. Um, 
at the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine in Ithaca. And yeah, I just am constantly learning, constantly trying to take herbal workshops, go to conferences, you know, all the things that we do where we never stop learning as herbalists. Mm. But yeah, that's basically my my origin story. And now you get to interview all sorts of herbalists and continue continue the learning. Uh, are you currently taking any sort of courses right now? I um not at the moment. I'm not taking it. I have my perimenopause one. I just finished a course with April Coburn on perimenopause. Oh, nice! Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, and um, it was a five week <laughs> course, and and I learned so much. And it's it's something that is really important for, for me to learn right now because not only am I entering, I'm 37, so I'm kind of like entering closer towards that um, perimenopause age myself. But most of my friends and so many of my herbal clients are in the perimenopause phase. So many people are hungry for classes on it. I would love to be able to like teach a workshop to my local community about it and um, just support people in this like transition that can be challenging. So totally. Yeah. April's yeah. been on the herbalist hour before she was an yeah. awesome interview. Has she been on your show yet? Not yet. I would love to have her though. She's so cool. Totes. I really love her like down to earth and she's so smart and yeah, talented. So I'm really impressed by April. Absolutely. How about you, Isaac? What, how'd you get on the plant path? Well, um, I was homeschooled uh, mm -hmm. until like ninth grade. And so I was kind of allowed to be also there's woods behind the house and I was allowed to just kind of roam in the woods all day. <laughs> Not all day. I had like, you know, studies too, but sure. um, I, I grew up in the woods a lot of the time playing in the creek, learning the plants. And I, I like would it would I was able to make my own like syllabuses, you know, syllabi cool. <laughs> or <laughs> curriculum sometimes. And so one of the, one of my courses that I like self-motivated courses was learning all the wild edibles in, cool. in the forest when I was about nine. So that was like a really, you know, important time in, in that plant path. And I got to really learn all the different plants and like what they, what they're used for. And start, yeah, I started eating pokeweed when I was nine and uh, black cherries and all those sassafras, all those, all those plants. So, and then I would, I, I always like enjoyed being in, in the woods uh, th throughout my life, but I, after college, I got into permaculture more. Mm. And so I had the uh, opportunity, I was allowed to uh, utilize a little less than an acre area and I got to experiment there and um and try out all these permaculture techniques and and stuff and collect plants there so um i did that while also uh doing the music thing throughout my 20s um and then yeah we yeah so just all kind of continually built built that love of plants so i'm not an herbalist uh but i'm a definitely a plant plant guy <laughs> oh i could tell uh your your parents seem like pretty cool people are they into herbs and, and all that as well um, my mom, my mom is, uh, to a certain degree, like she had like Susan Weed books and, uh, yeah. Rosemary Gladstar books. <laughs> and so, awesome. and like all, all other kind of books too, that like we, <laughs> sorry, our little puppy oh, is, uh, he's on. Uh, yeah. He's bring, so bring him in. Oh, so cute. <laughs> it's for oh my goodness. Hi for Simon. <laughs> so if you're only listening on the audio, you should treat yourself and watch the YouTube video for all this cuteness. What's going on? <laughs> you call him? Is it here? You call him her? Percy. Yeah, it's a Percy, boy. Percy. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's, he's a little sweet sugar plum, like a persimmon. Yeah. <laughs> Adorbs. Um, and Percy's a good, like you know, it's good to have a two-syllable name with a e, like a hard, like a consonant, and then a <laughs> yeah, and an e, like Percy or Macy or something like that. Very Kings. important. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was called Macy in high school uh, oh, nice. on occasion. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. But dear listener, do not call me Macy. <laughs> yeah, you listener. call me Mace if you want. <laughs> Hand down. <laughs> it's Mace or Mason. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mace is a little bit more masculine. Yeah, mm -hmm. like a, it's like a uh, a weapon. <laughs> totally <laughs> love that. Oh, That's or, right. We're the herb yeah. too. Yeah. 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 Sorry to interrupt, Isaac. Oh, uh, yeah. So my mom always was interested in that. She was like the black sheep of her family. Um, she's the one who wanted to homeschool us. Then she unschooled us. Then she went on this like whole, you know, uh, new age thing. And, sure. you know, so she, so we were kind of along, along for the ride in her <laughs> like uh, development. Mm. 
uh, from like being like a conservative, like Mennonite sure. to, you know, going through that whole progression. Um, so my dad's like a software engineer type. Uh, he not as interested in, but he was, you know, his, his father was born on a, on a homestead in central West Virginia. And, you know, I would visit my grandfather and learn some of that kind of stuff. And that that's in the blood as well. Like both, both of my great grandparents lived on home, like on homesteads, grew plants. Um, and my, my mom's side, my grandmother, you know, grows a garden. So that was always, always there too. Yeah. Just a lifestyle. Absolutely. And, and you're, you're uh, you have Mennonite in your background and is it Percy Amish? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, Percy. Percy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In central New York, we have a lot of Amish families. Uh, the land is relatively inexpensive. There's less like regulations out here compared to like closer to Albany or New York city. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of old farms that, that are, you know, kind of going to waste. So um, the Amish have moved in a couple of different communities and it's been really interesting to see how they do things. Mm -hmm. um, and also they have wonderful dogs. <laughs> yeah. Just a quick break from the show to thank our presenting sponsor, Oshala Farm. Oshala Farm is a beautiful and vibrant certified organic herb farm based in Southern Oregon, where they grow and sell over 80 different plant species. The founders, Elise and Jeff Higley, have been longtime friends, so I highly trust their growing methods and ethics. You'll love the potency and vibrancy of all the herbs they have to offer. To learn more and purchase their herbs and other organic goods, head to oshalafarm.com. So thanks once again to Oshala Farm for sponsoring the Herbalist Hour. Now back to the show. Enjoy. Well, tell us a little bit about your farm. Is it uh, Cohosh Creek? Yeah. Yeah, we call it Cohosh Creek Herb Farm. And... Uh, it's about seven acres and we have a little pond and some creeks and we've been growing tons of medicinal herbs and fruit and nut trees. Um, and we have a big red barn that we are able to host events in. When we first moved in, it was full of stuff like epically hoarder level layers of poo. I like to, to <laughs> refer to it as a, as a crap sandwich. On, on the bottom, <laughs> there was like, like century old cow manure. And in the middle was just like crap from people that they like hoarded like for stuff, decades. Antiques. And then on wow. top was a layer of pigeon, pigeon poop. So yeah, crap sandwich. Yeah. But we cleaned all that out. Yeah. Now it's gorgeous, <laughs> like beautiful hand hewn beams and lots of space. Um, yeah. It's a really beautiful barn. Yeah. Yeah. So we love it here. We're super blessed to have found this place. It's an absolute dream come true for us to be able to have a place that we can grow and gather our friends and community we didn't know much about this area we were living like an hour away um when we were looking at places but we really lucked out with neighbors and yeah. um there's an amazing ag scene here with other herb farms and permaculture projects and uh, potlucks and coffee shops are opening up and yeah it's just like a really cool place to be so yeah, part of it is I mean, we got here in 2019, November of 2019, right before all all that happened. So it was a right. good time to get to to get a place we might probably wouldn't have been able to. But this area is like it's relatively inexpensive, so people are moving here because you know you can't you can't live in Hudson Valley anymore <laughs> or where you know sure. wherever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you're hosting a conference, which we'll get more into later. But you're saying that this is not a crap sandwich that people are going to be. At attending it's it's all beautiful and and cleaned up now it's definitely not a crap sandwich anymore <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we power washed it yeah for That's like nice. days of power washing i mean we cleaned floor. everything out put a new floor um and the the wood underneath is just so gorgeous it's oh. you know it's old growth elm and mm -hmm. cherry and and uh red pine red red uh red oak um from the 1800s you know and they sheathed it in metal so it's been it's been kept dry over yeah. the, the the century or so um i mean they probably did that in like the 20s or 30s maybe 40s 50s um but like a lot of barns around here have have gotten wet and then they're they're all falling down but this one is has retained Sorry. it's it's yeah it's it's magnificence so really a privilege to be able to to like take care of that barn actually, you know, because yeah. it's, it's like, I, I, I can consider it like a, a living entity right. and you could tell Absolutely. when you, you cleaned it out. Um, it, it, it loved, it loved it and it loved having people yeah. in there and it loved having music in there because mm -hmm. the whole, like those old, old 
hand hewn, it's all wood. It resonates. The whole thing resonates, mm -hmm. you know, when you're playing music in it. So it's a, it's, it's a special place. Yeah. Did you end up doing anything with the apple orchard? Yeah. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, nice. Yeah. So we have this, it's ancient apple orchard. I mean, I'm not sure how old the apple trees are probably 80 years old, maybe a hundred. Um, but it's been overgrown with ash and sherry and the emerald ash borer has only just arrived to this area. Mm. And I remember like 12 years ago in, in Pittsburgh, um, it decimated all of the ash trees. And now you can see these giant ash trees that are dying and it's very sad. Um, but I'm, it also gives me an excuse to be able to take out all those ash trees from the apple area. And, and that's like the first process, the first step in the process of rehabilitating that area. Um, give the, the apple trees more light and, and then I'll start pruning them down because it takes, it takes a while to, to, to rehabilitate the apple trees. You can't just like cut them back all at once. <laughs> but the apples are great. They, they yeah. still produce and um, there's some really unique ones. There's some that have like little, it's like white flesh with pink kind of venation mm. on the inside. And there's some goldens and all sorts of really tasty apples. Yeah, I wasn't even able to identify some of them. I might send them into Cornell um, and see because last year wasn't a good apple year because of the late frost. But um, yeah, I'm excited to to rehabilitate that space. And also that's a, it's a lot of good firewood because <laughs> we, we heat with with wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the, all the ash. So do you use uh, the apples on any of your products, AC? By the way, that's the travelingherbfarmer.com. Yeah, I have a little herb business, Traveling Herb Farmer. Um, not apples, but I, I would like to make my own apple cider vinegar mm. if we have a good apple year this year because I've made fire cider a lot in the past. Um, love me some fire cider. I was a huge advocate during the whole mm -hmm. fire cider um, fiasco. Debacle, yep. Yeah, I was just like furious and... Uh, would lead tons of fire cider workshops all over the awesome. country wherever I'd go. I'd be giving out flyers and zines on how to make fire cider. So I would love to make that. Um, but yeah, I don't have any, any Apple specific products at the moment. Yeah. There are a lot of other fantastic plants that are already here though, too. Oh yeah. So like ha so Hawthorne, many. like she makes a lot of Hawthorne. There's wild mm -hmm. Hawthorne everywhere here. Yeah. Um, and bone set. Mm -hmm. uh, Go have uh, very cohosh. cohosh. Yeah, we have more of the blue cohosh and mm -hmm. also red, the red baneberry, which is also called a red cohosh. Um, so we're planting some of the black cohosh too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's some of the goldenrod and New England aster and oh, yeah. elecampane and mullen, tons of plantain, tons of red clover. It's like we could we could have not even planted an herb right. and still <laughs> an herb farm. Yeah, oh, really. <laughs> yeah. We're also planting like, you know hundreds of species <laughs> of, of, of herbs and trees and, and so on. Yeah. There's not a lot of, this is kind of like um the North Northern hardwoods more. It's a maple uh, and birch and uh, some hemlock and, and, and white pine, but more like red maple, sugar maple. We have a, we have a sugar bush. We've been boiling down sap, mm -hmm. um, but there's not a lot of the uh, spice bush and the sassafras um, and those kind of, those kind of trees and, and plants. So we're putting some more of those in this area. Cause I'm, I'm seeing, I mean like this with the way that the climate is changing, like I, I, I see that happening and I'm trying to like make some, some places for those, those plants to spread too, you know, like as it gets warmer here, they'll do better here. And they already are. I mean, Absolutely. there are some, there are a few spaces in this, in, in this immediate area where we are, it's a little colder, but there are a few places where there's spice bush. And they're just like starting to, to really like mm -hmm. take root there. Um, but yeah, so we're doing a lot of those more native and like close to native plants as well as like the permaculture, like, you know, persimmons. Well, yeah, persimmons are actually also an, a native that's not mm. quite native here, but, you know, is now like we had like a zone zone seven winter this winter and we're a zone so it was is considered zone four, um, mm. you know, 20 years ago. So <laughs> like we didn't even get below zero. Like, <laughs> uh, does that mean it's getting warmer? Is that what you're saying? Zone it's seven getting, or zone four? Way yeah, warmer. yeah. Zone I mean, seven that... is warmer. So like, yeah. Okay. Four, zone four was like, we would get below 20 degree winters and like feet of snow. And zone seven is a little bit more like coastal, like yeah. uh, 
Cape Cod. Or Virginia. Um, like, yeah. I mean, this isn't a zone seven, but we had a zone seven winter. You know, it didn't get below. Yeah. It barely got below 10, de 10 degrees, mm -hmm. you know, and that's usually there's like two weeks where it's below. It's like negative 20 at least. So. <laughs> yeah, my wife is a, she grew up in Wisconsin. We just moved to Wisconsin last year. This is my first Wisconsin winter and oh. it was it was easy. I mean, it snowed yeah. once, like a big snow, and it stayed for about a week. Uh, but it's like, it feels like spring out there. I was just out there in a t-shirt and no no uh, shoes or socks on. You know what I mean? Wow. So, yeah. In, so it's, in early March. Yeah, it's wild. Very wild. But yeah. Isaac, I want to say, uh, you said you are you don't consider yourself an herbalist, but just listening to you talk, I want to say, you, I, I want to declare you're an herbalist, all right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I declare. <laughs> well, you're on the herbalist hour too, so you got to yes. be so, in yeah, some yeah. way, shape, okay. or form. But well, let's really talk a little bit. So yeah. yeah, you know a lot, and you know I was talking with my my aunt Abby, and mm -hmm. she was asking me all these questions, and I, she doesn't consider herself an herbalist either. And I'm like, Abby, you know way more than I do. She she's been doing this for decades. You know what I mean? So yeah. I don't know. It's a state of mind, but um. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about your podcast. It's called the Plant Cunning Podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. Be sure to pause the episode, go and subscribe to their show on your podcast player of choice. Uh, first, of, first of all, I'd love to hear you define what plant cunning is. Feel free to take it away, either of you. Yeah, so, that. so the the cunning folk um, were the village healers in uh, England and in colonial in, like, English colonial America. Um, so they 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 were cunning because they knew how to do things. So cunning really comes from knowing and not just knowing, but like skill, having skill. And so it, it doesn't have the connotation of being like tricky as much right. uh, in, in the old way. So the cunning folk, the cunning men and women, um, like wise women, the village wizards, they would know all the herbs. They would know how to heal. Um, and they would also know like magic and divination. So, and, and this is something that you find and throughout cultures across the world, all like all traditional cultures, uh, oftentimes like the village wise person, they know the herbs and they also know and they know how to heal the physical ailments, but they also know the spiritual ailments as well and how and how to work with those. Uh, so that's kind of the the idea behind the podcast. Um, we we interview a lot of herbalists and we interview like very science based herbalists like Seven Song, um, but we also interview astrologers magicians and spiritual practitioners and like other kinds of healing like energy healing too um partly because that's what we're interested in sure, you know? and it gives of course. us a chance yeah <laughs> yeah so it gives us a chance to like talk with these people like read their books and then speak with them and then like you know it gives us a chance to learn and then it also helps maybe expand the um the, the networks of of people who are maybe they they know about herbs but they want to know more about other kinds of healing and they want to see like who are the teachers here if i want to take a class or if i want to get a book who are the people who who know about astrology and and who do i really vibe with um so that's part of the part of the 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 thrust the 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 purpose of the, of the podcast yeah why do you think cunning has like a negative connotation these days well i mean part of it is I mean, that's just the way language goes. Part sure. of it is also why the, the word like witch has a very negative connotation. I mean, it's changed too, but also like, um, even like there are, there are other words like. That's probably why, because if the cunning folk were associated as witches and wizards and magic, you know, then it became taboo. It became like, oh, you're a trickster because magic is not real and yeah. herbals, herbs can't work. Like, you know, with the, um, the separation of like healing with from uh, like the natural healing methods with the more like scientific, you know, material reductionist sure. model that we have been adopting. So I think that that's part of it too. Yeah. It has to be a trick. I mean, that may yeah. be, right. I think there may be other reasons too, but yeah, mm -hmm. anything that's not explained by science yeah. is either, either that person is uh, lying and being a trick trickster or they're a fool. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know that's not true. I don't think that's true, uh, but that's the that serves the dominant paradigm. So maybe that's why. That's why I love herbalists is because I feel like we have a really good grasp on both the science and the magic. And yeah. we try to we try to do that, that with our show as well as have all sorts of different backgrounds on, so we could kind of learn from all the different you know viewpoints and all that. And um, yeah, it definitely interests me as well. Um, 
speaking of magic, I know you do have a lot of like uh, astrology episodes and magic episodes. How would you, how would you recommend someone who's not too familiar of the magic side? Um, someone kind of just dip their toe in and, and try to maybe live a little more magical life. Hmm. Um, I think since, you know, this is primarily people were, who are listening are primarily are plant lovers and nature lovers. I think they already experience the magic of nature every time they go out to their sit spot and sit on a beautiful rock by a stream or on a mountain or in the desert. And, and um, I think the best way to really like feel that magic is to just sort of drop in into the place and the spirit of place and to listen and to try to open up the more than ears type of listening, but like the heart centered listening where you like drop from your head into your heart and you're open to experience like the wonder of nature because sometimes you'll receive messages or sometimes you'll have realizations. Um, and I think that we underestimate our own individual power to create um, and influence the world around us, to create change or influence the world around us. Because when we go out into nature with this like open heart and this um, gratitude that often, you know, we experience in just being in such beautiful places, I feel like the animals around and the plants around appreciate that and they respond to that. But if we go out there with anger and frustration and um, feeling like hungry for power and our chainsaws just like coming through the forest, like that creates a different feeling. So I don't know. I think the wonder of nature is the best way to get in touch with magic. Um, and you start to realize that you can change things. I think magic is um, a lot about just like finding your own power to mitigate your situation and the surroundings and to drop into this like centered rooted feeling um to be able to like move back out into the world and and so also when we talk about magic there kind of are a lot of different things that that, that word means too and there are a lot of different definitions for what magic is and i think one of the the especially for the uh, listeners of this podcast i think one of the easiest entrances into the the world of magic is like via natural magic and just finding out the the other uses of of herbs you know and there those are in like, like the encyclopedia of natural magic by john michael greer is a good one um a good book to get if you want to, to get involved in that but there are a lot of other ones but one of the ways of looking at magic is that it's uh, there's a definition from the early 20th century but it's causing change in consciousness in accordance with will and mm. that might not seem that like a lot at first, but if you really think about what, what consciousness is and what consciousness means, um, from an esoteric perspective, the world is consciousness. The, like consciousness is not an epiphenomena of nature, of, of matter. Uh, matter actually comes from consciousness. <laughs> and so by changing your mind and being able to, um, like wearing a solar herb at the you you collected at the right time when the sun was in the mid heaven on the day of the sun sunday and and putting that close to your heart and wearing that you feel more confident you feel more uh like you have more vi better vision you're you're more solar you know and so it's tapping you into this this subtle web of of ca of causality it's maybe not even causality it's correlation it's it's the the everything is connected and on a, on a, in a way that is more than just the physical. Um, but even just from looking at it from a physical and like a psychological perspective, um, there's a lot of value in, in, in using these, these techniques, like, like magical herbalism, astrological herbalism. Um, so that's what I would suggest for, especially herbalists to get into is, is looking at the natural magic aspects and, and, and trying it for yourself. Like, collecting St. John's wort in the hour of the sun on the solar, you know, so the, the, so the solstice, um, and wearing it on your heart, you know, something like that. Mm. Yeah. There's, and there's a lot of other things too. There's, yeah. There's sure. One other thing that just came to mind too, is like, um, 
ways of protecting and clearing ourselves. So as herbalists, yeah. we're meeting with so many people in our community that have health problems, psychological problems, like, you know, all, all sorts of things going on. And um, some of the first things that I was interested in magic were like how to cleanse myself from um, negative experiences and how to protect myself from negative experiences, especially being on the road as a traveler, like all sorts of things can get thrown at you. And so I, I have these like simple little protection rituals um, that you can get more complex with, but just like a sphere of protection, a circle of protection where you imagine a ball of white light or a pillar of white light coming through you where nothing can permeate that barrier that you're creating around your energetic field other than love, you know? Mm. And I would, when I was traveling, I would do that circle of protection around the bus and I would ground it to the road. And so every time, where, wherever I went, you know, cause you're always moving um, when you're traveling, like it was grounded to the pavement itself, to the stone of the earth. And I, I swear I got out of some really hairy situations like that bus had some magic around it you know um driving on cliffs without a rear axle attached for example <laughs> um and you know sometimes i would do a shield of invisibility if i would see like state troopers on the side of the road i'd be like okay shield of invisibility <laughs> or a shield of somebody else's problem <laughs> <laughs> and uh uh, they would just be like, oh, I don't want to look at that bus. Like, that would be so annoying to pull them over and flip the whole bus, you know. Right. We would be targeted as like a, a school bus of traveling kids. So, yeah, so that kind of things. And then clearing, like, after any sort of session, um, just spending time barefoot in nature to, like, ground and release into the earth, doing a cleansing mm. bath with herbs and salts, um, a ritual bath that you can use cleansing herbs and then take some, take a bucket of the bath water and pour it to a trusted tree friend who can handle that negative energy much better than you and release it. What? Yeah. They like feed on it. They, yeah. It's, it's like our, our carbon. Yeah. Then same way with, with etheric energy. Or just like washing your hands and face. If you can't take yeah. a bath after, you know, an herbal session and kind of like, or using smoke, you know, yeah. using burning herbs, like, um, yeah, so the protection and the cleansing rituals, I think, are actually a really good place to start because then you're grounded in like the safety of your energetic field being protected before you start engaging with other, um, you know, entities or other um, spirits or whatever it is that you're getting into. Yeah, and I, th I think a lot of a lot of herbalists actually know about this. Like they 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 yeah. do cleansing and protection uh, rituals, and like. People call it smudging now, um, and and maybe like you should use a, a different word, or if you're getting white sage, you should only get it from ethically harvested sources. Uh, but there are a lot of other herbs that you can use for that, like yeah. mugwort is a fantastic cedar. herb, cedar, red cedar, um, and those those are you know traditional, long time, um, and you know bathing bathing your field in, in in like that cleansing herbal smoke can be a very helpful thing, and and a lot of people do that already. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think part of it also is like it's it's recognizing the subtle framework and recognizing it's, it's the relationship too uh, between between everything and that's and interacting and, and interacting with that is it's is, is part of what magic is. Yeah, mm. yeah. Just listening to you to talk, I'm like having these thoughts of, of things that I didn't necessarily consider magic that I was already doing. Um, right. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, AC, you were saying, um, I mean, I want to say I want to distill down the first part of what you were saying. It was like presence, gratitude, and being in nature. Mm. And um, I just really vibed with that. I'll share like a a story. I yeah. I did um, psilocybin once, and I was walking in the South Eugene Hills. Um, I was actually with a friend. <laughs> and we were walking down the hill, mm. and there was a deer. There was a couple of deer. And I swear we walked right by it and, and we were probably like 10 feet away. And I feel like normally it would have been skittish and just bounced away. But like, it was just chilling there. We, I felt like we were just hanging out with it. And you were talking about the presence and the animals, like just coming around and not being mm -hmm. bothered by you. And I, I, I feel like the psilocybin had me so present in that moment that it yeah. just felt like this whole magical experience. But um, yeah, 
I, I do want to say uh, we have a Herb Rally Schoolhouse member joining us right now, Diana. Um, hey. So Diana says, love this interview and the topics of magic you're exploring. Do you both work with the elements and directions and ceremony or ritual? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I, I think that's the fa fa pretty foundational to a lot of most traditions is the elements and mm -hmm. the um, directions. And there are a couple, there's a lot of different ways to do that too. And I've worked with them in different ways. I really like, even like the lesser vanishing ritual of the pentagram. Um, and it is a way of working with the directions and the elements. What is that? So it's a, it's a, a <laughs> one of the foundational uh, rituals from the golden dawn, which is a, a very influential order from the late 19th century. Um, and I'm actually putting out a book this in in April uh, called The Heathen Golden Dawn, which is using Golden Dawn ceremonial techniques with um, Norse and and Germanic uh, symbolism and 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 the deities and, and runes and so on, uh, because the original Golden Dawn used more Egyptian and Christian and and uh, and, and and Jewish uh, words and names of, of of God and so on, divine names. But so with the Lesser Banishing ritual. The lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram, you you call an angel in each of the four directions. Um, and yeah, you, you call in divine names. And so you're cleansing the the area that you're in and your own your own etheric and astral uh bodies. Um and it's like a ritual, like if you've ever called in the seven directions or the four directions, like you're calling in each direction and a um like Archangel, Archangel Michael, for example, from one direction, and yeah. you're drawing this pentagram, pentagram yeah. in like, you imagine like a blue flame, like- So you're, you're visualizing you're it. You're visualizing, it's a whole ceremony, and it's pretty quick, and it just it clears your space and yourself, and offers like a field of protection, kind of like I do, the circle of protection. Yeah, and it's a good way, especially do, something to do before meditating. Mm -hmm. um, Another one that's really good is is the the sphere of protection, like the more elaborate one, where you call seven directions. You do each of the four directions, and then spirit above, spirit below, and spirit within. Um, and that's a really great ritual too. Which there are there are a lot of different versions online. You can look up all these online, mm -hmm. um, and those are a little bit more intense than just like a a, a basic sphere of like a, a cleansing sphere, white sphere, um, or like other you know rituals. But it, they don't take that long either, and they also build with repetition too so it's something you do every day and then it like really cleanses your and you can you can feel it when you you know you're drawing these these pentagrams on on the level of the physical level with your hand as well as the mental level by by visualizing that mm. and then you have and so that's another thing that i I, th I think about when with the esoteric worldview which a lot of people like they think it's very woo woo but if you just look at like the, the physical realm is what you can touch and taste and, and, you know, experience in that way. But the, the etheric realm is just the realm of, of energy. So like when you're in a car and you, and you, and you go over a bump and you go, woo, or when you're in an elevator and you, you can feel like that's your etheric body and physical body separating slightly. And it's, that's hmm. the, 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 the chi, the, the prana. Um, and then the astral plane is just the, 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 the mind it's, it's, it's thoughts images um and we experience this every day you know and then there's the even higher plane of of pure consciousness which you also experience uh, at all times the it's very difficult to recognize because um and one one thing you can do to do that is just ask yourself how am i conscious or am i awake and there's an immediate thing that happens where you can you you are conscious of being conscious mm -hmm. and that's kind of like the spiritual plane and those all those planes can be uh, your awareness of those planes can be developed through practice, you know? Absolutely. And just one other thought on um, like an example of my, in my life of using the directions. Um, I'm just thinking of our, anytime I build an altar, you know, I'm like incorporating the directions into it and we have a monthly, every full moon, a women's circle. And so people will bring altar items and we'll like honor the directions with, water in the west and a feather in the east and a special stone or like root in the north and a fire like a candle in in the south or bright red stone in the south or something like that and um yeah just little things like like that in you know daily altar building or um 
rituals, like a women's circle, like calling in the directions creates this container and then, you know, releasing them at the end, um, you know, breaks that container. And so it, it just creates like a really safe and, and special environment in the air. And it's just like, I don't know the the direct the directions the elements like they're they're an integral part yeah so I'm glad that your listener asked that question thank you yeah thanks Diane and thanks for joining us live um, yeah. yeah she says totally relate yeah. um, does the altar get disassembled after each women's session yeah and then you build it up next time okay mm -hmm. everyone brings like an altar item that's special to them and then when it's our turn to speak instead of passing like a, a talking item people will just pay pick an item from the altar to hold for their turn to speak. I just had deja vu big time. That's so crazy. <laughs> really? I love that, Mason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow, that is so bizarre. Uh, cool. Uh, well, <laughs> all right, let me uh, recenter myself. Oh, yeah, yeah, right before this episode, too, I uh, um, before jumping on the call, I sat out, or I was saying I was barefoot yeah. in our 0.1 acre yard so it's not too naturey but um yeah I was just like staring at the sun just trying to center myself and prepare myself for the episode so I guess that was a little bit of magic there as well you got it so seems like a nice transition to chat a little bit about Isaac's offerings I don't want I don't know if they're new sure. offerings or not but um uh, before we get into that I want to say a little testimonial from a friend uh left it on your Facebook profile page um and they say Isaac Alexander Salamander Hill offers really incredible Vedic astrology. Is it Geodish? Geotish, yeah. Geotish readings. The wealth, the wealth of knowledge he shares is a gift, and he is endlessly pursuing more to share. I'm very grateful for a recent reading I had with Isaac at a, as it opened new doors to self-exploration and clarity that I didn't even realize were there. Wow, what a journey we're on. Plus, he offers remedies in the form of service work and mantras to help with the difficult or helpful aspects in your own chart. Check it out if you want to dive deeper. So I just thought that was a nice introduction to uh, these offerings that you have. So can you tell us more about that, Isaac? Uh, sure. Yeah. So um, I've been studying astrology for a while now, but I've um, more recently, um, I've completed a, a program with uh, Freedom Cole in a, a specific tradition of um of, of Vedic astrology that it's the Kutananda Adas tradition that Sanjay Roth is the like lineage holder for, and he's a, a famous astrologer in India. Um, and so I've completed the, like the main course and then I'm, I'm doing now more advanced studies in that tradition. Um, and so I've been, and I really wanted to study in this tradition because one, it's like an unbroken tradition. So like Sanjay Roth's grandfather was the last Royal astrologer in Orisha. And then that, that family tradition goes back for many, many, you know, centuries. Um, but the other thing is that they offer remedies, which a lot of Western astrologers don't. And so the way I, I, I see it is like in the tradition sees it is you look at the, the karmic framework of a person, like the archetypical framework is another way of saying it. And you can see like where, where problems are and like why there are certain problems and then also offer some remedies. And, um, you know, those remedies often are, are like mantras or, um, or service work or donation to particular charities. Like say for instance, if you have like some certain depressive thoughts and it's because, because like the, the, your, the moon in your chart is afflicted by Saturn and, and Rahu, then you would donate to mothers with, uh, with a lot of trauma, you know, and that kind of like heals the wound out in the world as well as healing the wood within, because we are all connected and, and, you know, we're microcosm of the macrocosm. And so um, that there's those kind of remedies. And yeah, I've, I've just, I'm, I'm now doing it as donation uh, until I've completed the, the, these other more advanced studies, um, which I like, I like donation because people can, can give what they, what they, what they see as a value and what they have too. Um, and uh, people have been donating, enough you know enough to make it worthwhile to do and i've sure. also to, to, to learn from from each of these readings too so yeah i'm i'm offering basic remedies and the the chart reading um currently uh so people if people want to to do that they can email me at info at plant cunning.com info at plant cunning.com and we can set up a reading yeah 
Did you say how long they last the readings? About an hour. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So we'll, and, like go over the 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 chart with you. Look at some timing techniques too, like when certain planet ter- planetary combinations are getting activated. Like if you're in a rough time, is, is that going to keep going or is it going to get better soon? Uh, those kind of things too. So. <laughs> How about like um, help with say childhood trauma, anything? Well, every you have to look at the chart, and so every okay. chart is very different. Um, yeah. Childhood trauma is often going to be shown by like afflictions to the fourth house, okay, or even afflictions to the moon. Um, the moon shows your mind as well as your mother, and that also shows how those are related. You know, like if you have a mother who was very traumatized, then your mind is going to be more anxious. You know, what are the remedies consist of? So some of them are, are donations to charity. Like I said, um, some of them are mantras to a specific. Okay. Yeah. So I can do some, some basic remedy, uh, mantras that okay. I've already, um, done, you know, yeah. uh, and some of them are like Vishnu avatars and, and mm. you're, you're calling in that, that energy of, of that Vishnu is, is, is God, like the big in in the way i see it Vish, the name vishnu means the same thing as great spirit or the go- god with a capital g and then he he incarnates as different avatars and by you know bringing that energy in you're you're helping ease the, the whatever that planet is relating to as well so um so it's kind of like helping to ease ease the the difficulty of certain energies or helping to set like cuz the way i see the the reality is like everything is downstream of consciousness and so by working on like the, the higher level of of consciousness then you're you're creating opportunities for things to change but yeah Perfect. so mantras um and then there are also mantras donation um pujas too which are a little bit more difficult for a lot of people they're like those are spe- specific um vedic ceremonies that you like hire a vedic priest to do and i can suggest which ones would be good uh but Mm. like i don't do that myself and you'd have to you have to get in contact with a vedic priest so that's like less easy for like uh, a white person in america who doesn't has no contact with a hindu temple or any pujaris but there are some places you can do that online and then also i i have been because i also study like astrological magic um previously with like the picatrix which is a, a 10th century um it's latin comes from arabic uh manual of astrological magic so there are other kind of remedies too that you can that you can do and and connecting with even like if you're more into uh greek gods then you can work with aphrodite if you're having venus problems you okay. know or jupiter if you're having you know, uh, other problems you know problems with a teacher or problems with a husband um so yeah, and there's and even Christian, like you, there are a lot of saints. There's a lot of archangels that you can work with too. And so I can kind of see which, which archetypical, uh, which archetype is being triggered and, and point to the right, uh, energy, the right, the deity or the right pantheon. Pantheon, yeah. Well, what, which, 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 which deity or which archangel in that pantheon right. would be helpful? So, <laughs> yeah. So after one session, do you feel like you're, uh, client will have a, a toolkit uh, and a, like a game plan for moving forward? Uh, or do you think that maybe they'll want to, you know, meet with you again, say in like six months or so like that? Yeah. So it depends also on the client, what's going on with them. If they're having sure. like major problems, if it's just like a, a little thing. Um, and, you know, some people come to me and there's a lot going on that is not going to be remedied very easily or very quickly. And mm-hmm. some people are just their, you know, their life's pretty good. They just kind of want to see what's going on with them. And then I connect them with the right, the right mantra and, and then they're, they're happy and that's, that's all they need. Um, but generally like six months, a year, two years, um, is, is a good time to come back a year is, is usually a good, good time, like birthday or something like that. Um, also when the time periods change, cause the, there's like a, 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 a Dasha system. It's like a, a time period system has like chapters in your life and then sub chapters and each of those like changes when, when those change and that varies between like six months to five years the the smaller time periods so whenever those are changing it's that's another good time to 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 get a reading but some people will just do the one-off because they want to know what their chart looks like from the vedic astrology um perspective and it is just so detailed like the vedic astrology can just get down and 
to the very like minute details, like more so than um, other like Western astrology readings that I've had. Um, I'm really glad that Isaac's studying with freedom and learning these Vedic. Yeah, I'm still beginning to, you know, so like there's uh, I've, I've got a lot to learn. <laughs> Hence the donation based, um, yeah, charging method. But, um, so I read that really sweet testimonial from your friend. Have you heard other great testimonials thus far of people that have had readings? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the people who have had readings are very pleased with them. And they're yeah, telling awesome. their friends and yeah. pointing their friends to Isaac. So that feels good. I, the thing with astrology is like, I've been one, doing it for a while and it's like, I want to offer something that of value to people, you know, I want to be yeah. helpful to people. And so th this tradition seems like the the best way that I can do that in this realm. So yeah. AC, have you had your reading? Yeah, Did I, I mean <laughs> we he he's like keeping me in the loop on all of my like cycles and sure. yeah. <laughs> That's and, awesome. reading and sometimes like as you know, like as an herbalist, it's a little bit hard to read for your spouse or to like do an herbal consultation for your spouse yeah. or someone that's close to you. So I still actually do want to get another reading from one of Isaac's classmates just for an outside perspective, because there's that thing that happens when somebody's too close to you. You know what I mean? It's hard to be absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to be objective. Yeah. Well, uh, Isaac, hold me accountable. I'm going to hit you up. I'm going okay. to, I'm going to, I'm going to get one for sure. Okay. So you'll love uh, it. All right. Yeah, I'm stoked. Well, sweet. Well, why don't we transition to AC's offerings? Why don't you tell what you have going on with the uh, traveling herb farmer? Okay, sure. Um, yeah. yeah, I make herbal products. So I grow the herbs and I use all organic ingredients and make um, herbal skin salves and muscle rubs and um, some tinctures. I make a lot of tinctures and glycerites and formulas. So I make like a bitters blend and a clear mind for mental clarity, which a lot of people really enjoy and um, a heart helper blend and a grief support. So I'm, I really love making tinctures. That's like my favorite thing to do is working with the plants in, in that way. Um, and I also love uh, vending at herbal events or um, just local events. And I do the farmer's market in Cooperstown every other week on Saturdays. And um, it's a great way to like get herbs out there to people. You know, some people have never seen a tincture in real life. <laughs> These are essential oils. And I'm like, right. no, please don't put it in your mouth. <laughs> or please don't put essential oils in your mouth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I love being able to like expose people to herbs and they try the salve or they try the muscle rub and they do the loop and they're like, wow, my skin feels great. Or wow, my knee pain went away. Um, and I'm like, yeah, herbs work sometimes. It's great. So I, I like to do the local vending and I also really love teaching and I have uh, apprentices or, or interns that come to the farm and work with me in the herbal apothecary kitchen, making the medicine or in the fields or in the forest harvesting. And I really want to lean more and more into teaching because it just lights me up. Like I don't want to become a salve factory where I'm just like right. making so many salves. Like, <laughs> like I already have made 10,000 salves in my life. I kid you not. I have like a giant salve melter that makes 500 at a time. And um, I am realizing as I'm getting older, like the carpal tunnel is real from pouring and harvesting. And like my physical body is not going to um, be able to like keep up in in the long run. You know, I'm already like thinking about as I'm like an older person, like how will I sustain myself? And I think herbal education is is it. It's like makes me really happy to lead a plant walk or to teach classes. And um, I've done like a bunch of different herbal classes, like herbal 101 courses and um, herbs for the respiratory system or, you know, specific body systems, how to make salve, how to make fire cider, all these things. And I want to do more of that. So this, this summer I'm going to be teaching some classes at a local herb shop in um, Cherry Valley mm -hmm. called Weathertop Pharmacy. And um, there's a little restaurant called Origins Cafe in Cooperstown. And we're going to have some workshops there and, and then plant walks and things like that. So that's what I'm I'm leaning into um, with uh, my traveling herb farmer business. Are you um, seeing uh, clients as well as a clinical herbalist? Yeah, I... I consider myself more of like a community herbist than a clinical herbalist because of all of these other pursuits. I don't have a huge, um, 
I, I can't, I feel like I can't really take on more clients because I have such a wide network of community I'm already supporting. So I am making custom blends and formulas for people at the Cooper, for, that come to the Cooperstown market and um, my neighbors, like the Amish neighbors come to me for herbs all the time. So oh. I, I do see clients, but I'm not like advertising that as like open doors, like, you know, because I'm just right. so busy. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And I see a lot of, sorry. I, I was just going to say, I see a lot of clients from um, my travels. So like when I was traveling, um, I met people on the road who would never go to a doctor or see like their primary health care would be like a chat with me on the side of the road, you know? <laughs> so like I keep in touch with these people. I send people uh, care packages and free herbal medicine often. And um, they call me when their kids get sick or whatever. So I, I have like a wider network from just like the local neighbors community too, but from like my wider traveling community. Yeah. You wear a lot of different hats. That's the true herbalist way. You're a farmer, product maker, clinical herbalist, teacher yeah. um you'll mm -hmm. you'll also be teaching at the upcoming plant cutting conference which yeah, i'd like to get having, into yeah we have that conference coming up so so excited. that's uh july 26th to the 28th and that's at cohosh creek farm yeah. your property yep. so why don't you tell us more about the event um any confirmed speakers where people could register and all that yeah. sure uh, um yes you want to start okay well uh so pam montgomery is going to be keynoting Nice. Um, so we've got Pam, we've got seven song is going to be there. Um, and then Rebecca Beyer is going to be there as well. Who's a fantastic herbalist and folk magician, um, Appalachian magic and Appalachian, um, folk medicine from, she's from Asheville, um, or Western North Carolina. And then we've got some Lisa Fazio, who's a fantastic, mm. uh, local herbalist from Utica and she would be a great person to interview too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she does medical astrology, astrology too, but she's more focused. She's putting out a new book on Italian folk medicine. Oh, wow. And she's uh, very, very intelligent, has a lot to teach. So she's going to be there. Um, we have a, a gong guy who's going to do some gonging <laughs> in the, uh, the barn. Like sound Love healing. Love it. Healing That's like awesome. All of gongs. Wow. Yeah. And in the barn, it's going to be pretty cool. I bet. Acoustics are awesome in there, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for like the whole barn to be just reverberating with gong. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> there's Absolutely. a group called the People's Cauldron that does mutual aid and um, offers free herbal medicine out of their bus in Kingston, New York, and they're going to do a mutual aid mm -hmm. workshop where we'll ask participants to bring any first aid supplies or harm reduction supplies or tinctures or herbs, and we'll make um, mutual aid kits for the People's Cauldron like while we're here as well yeah and we have some um we have joanna farrar from uh coffee and divination podcast she lives mm. in vermont she's a permaculturist and uh magician um and d diviner and so she'll be there and zamboni funk uh who's an astrologer will also be there and we have some other we have a bunch of other people There's who a few are people who are like not confirmed confirmed yeah um, they will be soon yeah so and the we don't, the tickets are not available right now. By the time this comes out, they may be. Yeah. Um, and that'll be at plantcunningconference.com. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, you I'm mentioned sure. Z Zamboni Funk. He's one of your most uh, frequented guests on your show, right? Yeah. 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 We do, we do um, forecasts with him. So we, we oh, do cool. like a yearly forecast and then we're going to do a, um, we're going to start doing quarterly forecasts. So, you know, the, the seasons, um, it's when, when Aries, the zero air the sun goes into zero aries is the, the then the spring quarter so we're going to do one for that and there's a lot coming up this spring uh with the, these eclipses um and all this like pluto stuff so yeah yeah he's he's great him on. yeah that'd be fantastic um so just fyi this yeah this will probably be released in a couple months uh okay. yeah. we're, we're dropping from two episodes per week down to one episode per week because two is just untenable so oh my gosh that's, yeah, so, that's a lot that's uh, a lot yeah <laughs> and that, that's how we did it for like and i still have two to three interviews scheduled all the way through like may but um mm -hmm. i'm going to cut back after that but that's besides the point um so plant cutting conference.com folks could buy tickets it'll probably be up by the time this gets released um sure. a couple other things i wanted to say oh yeah isaac is your band playing at the conference too We'll see. I'm thinking okay. about 
I'm thinking about, I haven't been playing as much lately. I've been focusing more on like the homestead and on, uh, sure. studies. Um, but we'll see. Maybe we'll definitely have some live music. If not the hills yeah. and the river, some, but some folks will yeah. rock us out on Saturday night in the barn. Definitely. AC, do you sing or play instruments or anything? No, I'm not so musically entitled. I I do like to sing, like when we're at okay. the women's circles and stuff, sure. and around the fire and acapella. But well, you play banjo. Oh. A I play bit. banjo a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but Isaac's like a real musician, so I it's <laughs> like the same thing as like him not calling himself an herbalist. You know, like, right, I'm right, right. A musician in front of this guy because he's so talented. <laughs> Yeah, I, I watched your music video before the interview. I want to say it was called The Magician. Is that yeah, right? That's and there were, that was a very magical music video. I saw you draw on like the circle around the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can't be, but... We, yeah. we, we, did, uh, we, we did albums based on tarot cards. So oh, cool. the last one we did was The Fool and The Magician. It was the, you know, the, two, the two major arcana. And so we did, a, we did a song and a video for The Fool and a song and a video for The Magician. Awesome. We did one oh. for the, the Tower and, and some other ones too, so... Yeah. Sweet. I'll leave a link to the music video in the podcast show notes in the YouTube description, all that jazz. Um, awesome. Anything else you want to cover before we get out of here? Um, so by the time this comes out, we also may have our nine herbs charm um, initiation online course available. Um, and this is, we're going to go through, there's this, do you know about the nine herbs charm? I don't. So Tell it's, me this, about it. it's this old, old English uh, charm from the ninth century maybe 10th century um it goes back a lot that's when it was written down so it goes back older it actually references woden um and it's one of the few references to woden in um in in old english in anglo-saxon and it and it goes it, it's a it, it's a charm that that uses nine herbs and, and it starts with mugwort it says gemini thu mugwort it's like, it's like remember an- remember mugwort what you what you said um and it addresses each of the herbs so there's mugwort, so there's nettle, there's plantain, there's a bunch of other, there nine, nine in total. And we're going to go through and do a nine week course where we go through each of the herbs, uh, do some initiation, like taking flower essences and uh, infusions, trying to dream with the herb, cultivate a, a connection with the spirit of the plant, and then also go into the medical and medicinal, like herbal qualities of it too. Um, and share, share stories and, and do that for nine weeks and, and, and really learn the charm, learn those herbs, and get initiated into, in, in into that, uh, that charm and and, and those herbs. Yeah. Where is that going to be available? So uh, it's going to be available from plantcunning.com. Um, it's going to be our first like online course offering, like a real nice. online offering, and that's kind of kind of going alongside with the book uh, that will be out by the time this airs too. Uh, called the Heathen Golden Dawn, uh, which is more ceremonial magic from like a, a Germanic perspective as i as i mentioned earlier but this is this course you don't have to be interested in ceremonial magic you just have to be interested in these plants yeah yeah awesome and you think that'll be available by the time this comes out yes and if it's not just email us at info at plantcutting.com and we'll put you on the list awesome well sweet y'all this has been a lot of fun yeah (laughs) yeah this has been awesome thank you so much mason for having us this is like dreamy i'm like oh my god <laughs> herb rally what yeah that's great no i feel the same way and guess what dear listener i'll be on their show next week so i'm not sure when yep. that'll get released but um probably before this one <laughs> okay cool awesome yeah i'm a. Uh, we just we're stacked up like 10 episodes deep right now so like we gotta awesome yeah well this has been fabulous thanks again to uh diana for joining on this live oh diana did say you should try to get rising appalachia to the event <laughs> to the i don't know okay. i don't know if we have the budget for rising <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i i know from experience uh, we've actually hired them a couple times when i worked at mount rose herbs uh and then we had them play when i organized the brighton bush herbal conference once i think they gave me a massive discount when they did the brighton bush herbal conference but oh, but they yes love us herbalist. they really do yeah they're fantastic so well, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks to you two for joining me on the Herbalist Hour. Uh, shout out and thanks to Amanda for editing the episode. And thanks to you, dear listener, for tuning in. Uh, and we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye, Mason. Bye. Thank you.
Thanks so much for watching today's episode of the Herbalist Hour. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want more great herbal content, be sure to subscribe to our Herb Rally YouTube channel. Uh, if you enjoy these Herbalist Hour episodes and you'd like to join us live, uh, you can do so by becoming an Herb Rally Schoolhouse member. Uh, learn more at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. And if you want to get your first 30 days for free, use coupon code YouTube30 at checkout. So our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members get access to exclusive video classes, monographs, and a lot more more herbal community discounts, um, along with joining these live Herbalist Hour interviews. So one more time, herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. Enter coupon code YouTube30 at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. All right, we'll see you in the next episode and take care.